Hey, good morning, good morning. Welcome to Portsmouth Christian Church. What a great day it is to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen, amen. amen. We got a couple of events coming up. Uh, Wednesday night is our small group as usual. Uh, starts at 6.30. We're uh, on the second chapter of the book of 2 Corinthians. Uh, come out and be a part of that with us. The ladies' Bible study group, Thursday, March 9th at uh, 6.30. Uh, studying the book of Ruth. Uh, the Men's Fellowship Breakfast, Saturday, March 11th at 8 a.m. And also we are going to be doing a work day um, here at the church, among other things. So come out. We need as many men as we can to come out because I think we have uh, some refrigerators and freezers that we are getting for free um, from another church that had a food ministry. So uh, we need the help of the men that we can go and collect these and uh, bring them here to the church. Uh, also, VBS, uh, July 10th through the 14th, there's a volunteer sheet right behind my wife on the table that you can sign up for, and we still need plenty of volunteers for our VBS. So please sign up for something. Also, there is a prayer vigil for Andrea tonight at 8 o'clock um, at her house. And uh, for you guys that don't know her address, I've uh, added it into the bulletin. So uh, please, if you can, come out tonight. Uh, we're going to be singing a couple of songs, and um, then we're going to have a prayer vigil in the parking lot uh, for Andrea. So please come out and uh, be a part of that. I think that uh, it would be greatly appreciated by her and the family, and I think it will be a blessing um, to her also. I want to talk to you. Uh, this morning about our ongoing struggles, and we all struggle. So one day this little boy was uh, out in the yard, and he was selling a lawnmower. And he get, just wanted to get rid of it, didn't really need it, so he wanted to get rid of it. So this preacher comes up, and he says, Son, I want to buy your lawnmower. How much do you want for your lawnmower? And he says, Well, mister, all I really want is enough that I can buy myself a bicycle. So the preacher thought for a minute, and he says, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you $50 for your lawnmower. So he gave the, lawn, the little boy $50 and took the lawnmower. And he goes home, and he starts pulling on the cord, and it doesn't start. He pulls on the cord, and it doesn't start. Pulls on the cord, and it doesn't start. So he takes it back to the little boy, and he says, son, you sold me a lawnmower that doesn't start. He says, well, sir, all you got to do is cuss at it a little bit, and it'll start. So the, so the preacher says, son, I don't cuss. I'm a preacher, and, and for a long time now, I don't even know if I know how to cuss. He said, if you pull on that chain long enough, it'll come back to you. <laughs> so that's what I want to talk about this morning, that that's the truth. No matter how long we have been Christians, sin is still trying to enter our, enter our lives and take over. It's amazing how quick it can come back to us. And the passage we're going to explore today in our series in Romans is one of the most applicable passages in Romans, but is also one of the most controversial. And you'll see in your, your handout today, I've got Romans 7, 1 through 25. We're not going to read all of that. Uh, we'd be here till tomorrow. So um, we're going to go through bits and pieces of it. Since the early study in the history of Rome, Church scholars and Christians in general have debated just what experience Paul was referring to when he was talking about this problem that he was having. Paul's main point in this section is undebatable. The law cannot free us from spiritual death. And we often wonder, what does this debate question around spiritually? And I think there may be three main possibilities. Some think that Paul was describing the life of the Jew under the Mosaic law. Others think that Paul was describing his experience as an immature Christian. And then the third thing is, is still others think that Paul was describing his experience even as a mature Christian. Now I like to think about the third one as what Paul was actually going through because he was a very mature Christian. But I don't want to get into a huge debate about it because there are strengths and weaknesses from each one and you can kind of try to influence me on one or the other and it's really not the point here. 
But let's begin with the three observations about the most famous text. Observation number one is this. Romans 7 is a passage that grips us because we understand exactly what it's saying. We see ourselves in it. When Romans 7 is read, everyone understands and says, Amen, yes, that's right, it's true, that is me. Observation number two. Romans 7 seems to tell us about Christian's life as we actually experience it most of the time. You see, I don't think Paul is discussing the life of a person before they're a Christian, and I don't think Paul is describing the life of an immature or carnal Christian. In my personal opinion, I believe Romans 7 is describing the experience of all Christians, whether young or old, both mature and immature. Why? Because we all go through the battle of sin of the flesh. All of us, no matter how mature or immature, no matter how old or how long you've been a Christian, we all battle sins of the flesh. And when I read Romans 7, it rings true to me about my own personal experience, and it rings true to me about the personal experience of people I see on a daily basis. Think about what this says. I notice that Paul constantly says, I, 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 I. And I believe that each one of us in here today can take the place of Paul's I and put our eye in there. Because we all go through these problems and intense struggles on a daily basis. And guess what? It's not just past tense, it's present tense. Paul is actually experiencing the Christian life as he lives it day by day, year after year. And observation number three. Though some of us would perhaps wish it were true, there is no escape from Romans 7 in the Christian life. There is no real, es real es escape from our daily struggle with sin. But we must keep in mind that Romans 7 is not the whole story. Romans 7 is wedged between two chapters that may lay the groundwork for the Christian's triumph over sin in this life. Some might argue that Romans 7 describes a subnormal Christian life where the battle with sin is mostly one of failure. They would suggest that mature Christians should get their lives out of Romans 7 and stick with Romans 6 and Romans 8. And we're going to read through some of those through here in just a second. But I believe that Paul is presenting a unified viewpoint of the Christian's life, of which Romans 6 is a part, Romans 7 is a part, and Romans 8 is a part. What does Romans 6 say? That we have all died to sin. What does Romans 8 say? That if we die to sin, then we live by the Spirit because we are uh, raised through the resurrection, through our baptism. But if I could put into one word what Paul describes in Romans 7, 14 through 25, I would see, use the word struggle. Or you could take that word and make it conflict or war, whichever way you want to do it. Struggle, conflict, or war. That's what Paul says is going on in his life as a follower of Jesus. How many of us can say that also? That when we follow Jesus, that we always seem to have a conflict. We always seem to battle something in life. Why? Because it goes against what we believe and what we value. Tim sent me something on, um, on, mess, on my uh, shoot, text the other day about a, a school in Arizona that is um, stopping their um, affiliation with a Christian university because they don't want their Christian values to come down and influence people because now one of the ladies that is on there, she is a cat lady. And she wears cat ears and all this. And she wants to be whoever she wants to be. So she doesn't want to be influenced by a Christian university. So they want to cut ties with them. They've been with this university for seven years. And have taught many different people. But you see, today in our society, we don't want anything to do with Christianity. Why? Because it goes against what the morals of the world think of. Anything that you want to do is okay as long as you don't hurt somebody else. 
You can, you can be a lesbian. You can be gay. You can be a man translated as a woman or a woman translated as a man. You can do whatever you want to in the world today. What's wrong with it? They don't hurt anybody. But the Bible says that that's a sin. We can't go against what Scripture says just because the world says otherwise. And I would like to say that what is going on in our lives as Christian followers as well. We experience an inner struggle, inner conflict, inner warfare. You see, Paul says here that the problem is not on the outside, but the struggle is on the inside. Why? Because that's where our spirit is. That's where our heart is. The devil doesn't want your body. He could care less about your body. He wants your spirit, your soul. You know what was amazing to me? And I never knew this until I was watching videos the other day. Did you realize that the Grammy Awards um, happened on a night and it gave the Satan like 10 or 15 minutes of fame because they were coming out there with horns on and they were uh, representing to the, the audience of uh, uh, Satanism and things like that. But do you realize, blew me away, on the third day after the Grammys is when the revival took place. You see, Jesus took over Satan on the third day and conquered death when he arose from the grave. You see, we serve a God who knows exactly what he's doing. Three days. Three days after Satan had got his ten minutes of fame, Jesus got his fame again by having a revival that has not yet stopped. Because he conquered Satan once and for all. You see, Satan wants his fame. He wants your soul. And I was looking at the uh, uh, videos the other day again of people who sold their soul to Satan for fame. What does it, good does it do to profit a man to gain the whole world but yet lose his soul? I want fame here on this earth. I want to be somebody here on this earth. I want to be rich on this earth. I don't care because I really don't believe there's anything after this world. What a sad way to live. I could care less about this world. I just want my eternity with Jesus Christ. Paul says the problem is not on the outside, it's on the inside. The problem is not simply temptation out there, but temptation in here. Temptation in here. Paul is clearly saying that sin is something that we must wrestle with on a daily basis. You see, Jesus says that if you don't consider yourself to be a sinner, you call him out to be a liar. Because all of us sin. I like the old story of the church clock that was habitually too fast or too slow. The preacher placed a sign above the clock that said, Don't blame my hands, the trouble lies deeper. You see, when our hands do wrong, our eyes do wrong. Our, our feet, our lips do wrong. The problem is deeper. It is in our heart is where the real problem lies. Sin indeed goes deep, but Christ goes deeper. What is that, that, there, that the struggle inside of every believer? And the answer is indwelling sin. Look at the text twice. Paul says it very plainly. In verse 17, Paul says... So now I am no longer the one doing it, but it's the sin living in me. The Apostle Paul is speaking this. He says, what I am doing is not me, but the sin living in me. Even though we are followers of Christ and have the Holy Spirit, we will never be completely free from the pull of sin that is inside of us. That wants us to do wrong. As long as we're in our mortal bodies, the flesh, we will wrestle with sin. When we examine this text, we notice that it falls into three parts. Three different times Paul confesses his own personal struggle with sin. And I believe we can all put our names in there instead of Paul. Each one of these confessions reveals a different aspect of the struggle we face as believers. To live victorious in Jesus Christ. The first aspect of our belonging struggle is... The struggle to live up to what we know 
we ought to be. Paul wrote in Romans 7, 15 through 17. For I do not understand what I am doing, because I do not practice what I want to do, but I do what I hate. Now if I do what I not, not want to do, I agree with the law that is good. So now I am no longer the one doing it, but the sin living inside of me. Paul began with the amazing confession, I do not understand what I'm doing. We hear children do that, say that all the time, right? When they throw a rock through a window or they break a toy or do this or spill something. Why did you do that? I don't know. We hear that all the time, don't we? I don't know. But the adults are not much different, are we? There are times in life that we do something sinful and foolish, but when we ask why we did it, we turn around and say, I don't know. Why did you go to that place? Why did you click on that website? Why did you break that promise? Why were you with that person? I don't know. You see, we always have an excuse. We might answer, I don't know, to the question of why, but the real answer is I allowed sin to take over my life at that time. Paul confessed, I do not practice what I want to do, but I do what I hate. You see, Paul is saying here that he's wrestling with his own soul. He feels like that he has a split personality. How many of you guys feel like that sometimes too? Sometimes when you want to do the right thing, you don't do the right thing. Why? Because the flesh takes over. It's a split personality. Who are you really? Just like the little boy said, you keep pulling on that cord long enough, it'll come back to you. If you allow Satan to continue to, to fight you and fight you and fight you, and you don't stay in your word and you don't stay in prayer, eventually it will come back to you. That's why I love Wednesday nights. That's why I love the 90-day challenge, because we stay in God's word. We pray to him every single day. We listen to the music that he wants us to listen to. We tithe and give to our church. We do things that make him happy, but guess what? It makes Satan mad. You know, I got a, a, a text this morning, and I don't think, Miss Bridget, you don't care if I... Okay. She had texted me, and she talked about when, when, when Jesus had, um, had, had cursed the fig tree and told the fig tree that it would never bear fruit again. Why did he do that? Because the nation of Israel had rebelled. It said right before that that he had gone in and they had rebelled. That right before that, in the verses right before that, Jesus had gone into the temple and they were doing the money changing in the temple. So what did he do? He turned the tables over. Why? Because they claimed to be these great Christians and these great prophets, but yet they lived as the world lived. You see, back in those days, and, and even today, when you see the tree start to bud, that's when the fruit comes out. But this tree had leaves on it, but it was not given fruit. Why? Because it was deceiving the people. The people of Israel were being deceived by Satan himself. But they say they lived one way, but they actually lived another. How many of us do that? How many of us come in here on Sunday morning and say, Amen, God bless you, I love you, man. Jesus is good, he's God of my life. And we go out and we act like heathens on the outside. We have a split personality. You see, the battle is not just inside of a church, but it's on the outside of the walls of the church that are worse because that's where the world says they don't want any part of what we have. But I got news for them, I don't want any parts of what they have. Because their halves lead to destruction. Paul is saying, I'm struggling with sin of my own soul. He feels like there's a continual civil war going on inside his heart. William Barclay, a great commentator, wrote it this way. He says, the human situation. That's what he calls it, the human situation. And he's right. This is truly a human situation. We know the good, but we don't do it. We know what's wrong, and we fight against it, and we do it anyway. How many of you have ever gone somewhere, and you pay for something, and they give you uh, 2 or $3 extra in change, and you walk out, and you know that they gave you extra change, but you say, man, this is a great day. I got a little extra money. No, you take the money back in and say, I'm sorry, you made a mistake, and you give them the money back. 
I want to do what's good, but I don't do it. Oh, I must have just been lucky today. Today is my lucky day. No, today God has challenged you to be an honest person. Can you be that honest person? You see, Paul, one guy said that Paul must have been a golfer because golfers can understand this principle. Because you say to yourself that I'm standing on the tee and I'm getting ready to hit the ball. And I know there's a trap on the left side and I know there's a trap on the right side. And I don't want to hit it on either one, so I try to hit it straight down the middle. But what do I do? I hit it left and go right into the trap where I didn't want to go. Why? Because we're not focused. Remember the Sunday I said you focus on Jesus. Focus on Jesus. Keep your eyes on him so that you don't land in the traps of life. And, and, and when I was talking to Bridget this morning, and, and she says, why did God bring me to this, mor this morning? Because she is starting to do things in the church that she never thought she could do, like teaching. Guess what? Satan doesn't like that. Satan's going to say, Bridget, who do you think you are? Remember when you couldn't even talk? Oh, yes, I do remember. But God has given me a voice, and guess what I'm doing with it? I'm using it for him. You see, we conquer Satan with the help of God. We are not conquerors without him, guys. If you're trying to fix a problem of your own, you'll never fix it. I promise you, you will never fix it. But with God, all things are possible knowing right and wrong is not enough doing what right what is right is deeper and it must work within us the second aspect of our ongoing struggle is to come to grips with repeated personal failure you know, people may say, well, you've tried this and you failed. You tried this and you failed. You tried this and you failed. But yes, I got it this time. Einstein, one of the smartest guys in the world. How many times do you ever think he failed? He failed so many times he said he wanted to give up. But thank God he didn't. Thomas Edison, the creator of the light bulb. How many times do you think he failed trying to create light? Thank God he didn't give up. Let me tell you something. You're going to fail. But the key is, is are you going to get back up and fight again? Or are you going to stay down? Paul said in Romans uh, 7, 18 through 20, for I know that nothing good lives in me. Think about that. Paul says this. I know that nothing good lives in me, in my flesh. For I desire to do what is good what is within me, but there is no ability to do it. For I do not know, uh, I do, do not know to do the good I want to do, but I practice the evil that I don't want to do. Now, if I do what I do not want, I am no longer the one that does it, but it's the sin that lives inside of me. Look at verse 19 again. I practice the evil that I do not want to do. Now think, of that, think about this, guys. He's confessing this as an apostle and a follower of Jesus Christ. Even though we're Christians, we have to understand that we sometimes do what we don't want to do and keep on doing it. But those who are truly born of God develop in their heart a deep and honest and only hatred of sin. It has been said that the closer we come to God, the less we sin, but the more of a sinner we realize ourselves to be. How many of you agree with that? The closer we become to God, the less we sin. Why? Because we realize the sin in our life and we try to stop it. That's what Paul said here. After many years of striving to live as a Christian and serving as a minister, I've come close, uh, confess that sin doesn't surprise me anymore. Romans 3.10 says, there is no one righteous, not even one. So none of us in here can claim that we are perfect. 
Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. No one has to convince me of the reality of indwelling sin, not in the lives of believers of this church and not in my own personal life because I live with that reality every day. We are sinners. The last thing I do at night is repent of my sins. The first thing I do in the morning is repent of my sins. Why? Because I am a sinner. Paul says you have to understand your failures. You have to understand that we need forgiveness from our failures. It's hard for us to believe as believers to come to grips with what Paul is saying here. Now I would love to tell you that you could do A, B, and C and then you'll never sin again. But I've never found that in scripture. I wish I could. I wish I could find something in there that says, Tim, if you do this and you do this and you do this, you'll never sin again. But it's not in the Bible. It's not. We've got to come to grips with repeated personal failure. But the first step in healing is to admit you're sick. Healthy people don't need hospitals. Sick people do. The people who are made better by the power of God are the people who are not ashamed to admit their weaknesses. It is not until you understand that you can no longer do it where God will take over. God will not try to control your life. He will allow you to make the choice you want to make. But he allows the consequences to fall under those choices. Until you say, God, I cannot do this anymore. I need your help. I need you to take over. The third and final aspect of our ongoing struggle is that we have to admit the true nature of war going on inside of us. Romans 7, 21 through 24 says this. So I discovered this law. Here's my favorite verse in scripture. When I want to do good, evil is present with me. For, my, for in my inner self, I delight in God's law. But I see a different law in the parts of my body, waging war against the law of my mind, and taking me prisoner to the law of sin in the parts of my body. Oh, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Notice what he says here. This body of death. Why? Because he claims the flesh is what is causing him to sin. Who will rescue me from this body of death? You guys have heard me say it a thousand times when I want to do good. Evil's right there with me. And the Greek word for present with me means right beside me. <laughs> I threw Bridget for a loop Wednesday night because I went up to her and I said, I'm going to do something the devil never did. Leave you. She said, I got no words for that one. <laughs> Why? Because the devil wants you back. You think just because you have Christ in your heart that he's going to leave you alone? No, 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 no. He's coming after you harder. Why? Because he knows his time is limited. So he's going to work overtime. He's going to put in the extra work. He's going to work weekends. He's going to work nights. He's going to work holidays. He doesn't care about the pay raise. He doesn't care about any of that as long as he wins your soul back. So he will never leave you alone. Let me say this one more time. As long as you and I are in the flesh, we're going to struggle with sin. The battle goes on even on Sunday mornings. How many of you guys have kids coming to church and you want to beat them to death on the way to church? Why? Because that is the devil trying to start your morning out wrong. So that you can't come in here and be ready to praise and worship. You see, the Bible says, and I believe that before we ever come to church, that we ought to pray, pray that God gives us a glorious day. We ought to listen to Christian music on the way in. We ought to get focused on the way in so that we can be ready to praise and worship when it starts. We shouldn't start our praise and worship when the praise and worship starts. We should already have our praise and worship started already. But sometimes we don't do that. Why? Because the devil wages war on us on the way in. The battle goes on every day, even on Sundays. Why do we even try to hide the fact that we're in a battle? 
when we come to church on Sunday, we look good and cleaned up. But I can promise you behind every story, behind every good face, is a story. And I got a little story for you this morning. There's a, a, a freshman on my, on my bus. He's a ninth grader. And he comes to church, uh, I mean, he comes on the bus, he's got a cross on. Sometimes he has Christian sayings on his church and things like that, on his shirt and things like that. But uh, as you guys know, I say good morning, good afternoon to every one of my students. Have a good day when they get off the bus. To every one of my students, this guy never speaks. Never speaks. So the other day, I was on the, on the bus, and uh, I had my knees up on the seat like this, and I was turned facing the kids, and they were getting on the bus, and I was like, good afternoon, good afternoon, good afternoon. And, and he never got, uh, said a word to me, and I looked at uh, one of my kids on the bus, Amber, and I said, man, that guy never speaks. And I'm like, it's my goal to get him to speak. And she says, you know what, Mr. Tim? Today he got sent to the principal's office. I said, why? Because he threatened to commit suicide. As he was getting off my bus, I handed him a business card. Tim Todd, senior pastor. I said, if you ever need to talk, I'm here. I didn't say, hey, I heard you were threatening to commit suicide. Can we sit down and talk? I said, if you ever need to talk, I'm here. Friday afternoon when he got on the bus, he gave me that. And he said, Mr. Tim, my name is, and I'm not going to say his name. If I can reach one kid out of 150 of them, I got goosebumps. It's worth it. It's worth it. Paul says, no matter what I'm going through, no matter how many times you throw me in prison, no matter how many times you flog me, it doesn't matter. If I could reach one person for Jesus Christ, it's worth it. He spoke to me and gave me a cross. This means more to me than if somebody would have stepped onto my bus and said, Tim, here's a million dollars. And you might say, well, Tim, that's crazy. No, it's not. No, it's not. Because I don't know if he's a Christian. He claims to be. I don't know. But there's something going on in this kid's life where he has no hope. But we serve a Jesus that has all the hope we need. You see... I believe that we should want to be in church on Sundays because of the difficult week that we face every single week. And I know that your, your week may have gone good this week or whatever, but there was a struggle somewhere. And guess what? Next week, there's going to be a struggle. And guess what? Next week's going to be a struggle. And, and, and I was talking to Val the other day, and she's trying to do a new job. And it, it's like they want her to be the perfect one on the first day, and she's trying hard. And they're saying, don't you get this? Don't you get this? And she's like, I'm trying. You see, everyone struggles. You know, Miss Hudson was in the, in, in the hospital not long ago because her red blood cells went down. Everyone struggles. But you know what we know what we need to do? And when somebody's struggling, we need to pass them that business card and say, hey, look, I'm here. I'm here. If you need to talk, if something's going on, if you can't take it any longer, I'm here. You know, I was talking to, to, to Johnny the other day that was, he was here, and, and, and he had woke up at 4 o'clock in the morning, and he was having chest pains, and I said, do what? He said, yeah, I woke up at 4 o'clock in the morning. I said, Johnny, you're, you're blessed that you woke up. You don't know how many people in 21 years that I went to that didn't wake up, and it's what they call a widow maker. It's where you have a heart attack in the middle of the night, you don't wake up. Well, guess what he did? He said that hit him. So he went to Norfolk General. He had a 95% blockage. If we can touch one person. You see, I cared enough to tell him, hey, you need help. Are we willing to say that to somebody? I was telling Bridget, keep doing what you're doing. Yes, the devil's going to knock you down. Yes, the devil's going to hit you with an uppercut. Yes, the devil is going to hit you from behind. Get back up. 
How many times did they knock Jesus down? They spit on him. They bruised him. They cut him. They flogged him. They did all these things, put a crown of thorn upon his head, but he got back up. Guys, we are going to struggle. But what is the key? It's humility. Humility. What do I mean by that? Understanding that you're nobody without Jesus Christ. Humility. I'm nobody without Jesus Christ. I'm going to struggle, but I cannot beat this struggle. Why? Because I need Jesus. See, I heard a saying the other day, and I wrote it down. It says, the devil can never take away what God has already done in your life. All he can try to do is get you to question what God did in your life. You see, he couldn't take any way of, anything away from Adam and Eve because God had put them in the garden and told them and gave them everything. They had no needs. So he couldn't do anything to them. What, what did he do? He deceived them. He made them question what God did. How many times are you going through something? Um, Lonnie back there told me that years ago he felt like that he wanted to be a minister, but he was told he couldn't do it. He's told that he couldn't be good at it. He was told that no, don't, don't even try to do that. So he didn't for years, but now he's teaching Sunday school. Why? Because we serve a God who says when nobody says I can, I know I can. When somebody says, no, you don't, I say, yes, I do. Amen. Amen. Humility. I'm sure Bridget never thought she'd be teaching class in church. We had a couple that was here uh, years ago that when they got here, they didn't even know if God was real. When they left, they were baptized believers. Why? Because we showed them the love of God. We showed them what it was like to be a Christian. We showed them what it was like to have the love and the heart of Jesus in our hearts. We have to be humble. Honesty, honesty says I'm a wretched man, but humility says I cannot save myself. I believe that Satan licks his chops when we try to fight him by ourselves. without God, without others. How many of you guys have gone through something that you wouldn't have gotten through without the church? Without somebody being there for you? Without saying, uh, 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 without somebody saying, I'm praying for you. I got your back like God does. We can do this together. Don't do life alone. Victory in and over sin comes from above, not through us. Through God, through Jesus, through the Holy Spirit. That's where our victory comes. You know, I told the basketball team on, on one of their games, I said, you know, this team that you're getting ready to play tonight in the playoffs, they know they have you beat right before you even get on the court. They know they got you beat because they're better than you. That's what they feel. But what I want you to do is I want you to go in and from the opening tip-off, I want you to punch them in the mouth. And in the second quarter, I want you to punch them in the mouth. And in the third quarter, I want you to punch them in the mouth. And by the fourth quarter, you defeated them and you've knocked them out. Guess what? They won the game by four points. Why? Because they begin to believe. How do we get people to believe? in Jesus through honesty through humility through showing the love of Jesus that we have just like Paul says follow my example as I follow the example of Christ don't follow me as I would be Lord I don't even want you to see me sometimes follow my example as I follow the example of of Christ. You see, we talked about nobody is worthy. But the great part about it in 1 John 1 9 says this 
If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Guess what he says there? If we confess our sins. You see, Jesus doesn't want us to say, okay, Jesus, you know my sins. No, 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 no. Jesus, this is what I've been doing. Jesus, this is where I've been struggling. Jesus, this is what I can't do on my own. Jesus, this is what I need to repent of. Forgive me. For I am a sinner. He is just and faithful. And in Hebrews 4, 15 through 16, it says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way that we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Jesus says, when you're going through the struggles of your life, call upon me. Because guess what? Been there, done that. Got the stripes, got the scars, got the bruises, got the holes in my hand, the holes in my feet, the piercing in my side. I've got you. Let's go through our ongoing struggle against sin by holding on to heaven with honesty and humility. If you don't know that Jesus this morning, I just ask that you come down and let's just say, you know, I, I don't know if I have that relationship that I need with Jesus. And I want it more now than I ever have. If you're broken or beaten or bruised this morning, um, Jesus says that I am the answer. I've been through it. I can help you through it. God, I struggle just as much as anybody. I want you guys to know that. That's honesty and humility. Never been a perfect person. I'm not a perfect person today and never will be a perfect person. But made perfect through the blood of Jesus Christ. Only by his blood can I say,
your struggles to Jesus. Watch him help you go through your struggles. Watch him help you with your struggles. So we're going to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this glorious, glorious day that you have given us. Father, we know that uh, every day is not going to be a great day. Every day is not going to be the best day of our life and tomorrow better. Father, we know that as Peter got out of the boat and stepped out on the water, he was fine as long as he focused on you. But when he took his eyes off of you, he sank. Father, sometimes we sink. We need you to reach down your hand and pull us up. Father, I pray for our kids that are sick today. For little Sammy, Lord, that uh, is going through this virus or whatever. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would take it away. That is Satan at work in our lives trying to make us miss church and miss out on the blessings that we uh, earn because of you, Lord. Father, I pray for Andrea right now in the name of Jesus. You would touch her, give her strength, give her breath, give her air, Lord. And Father, as we come out tonight to do the vigil for her, that she will see how many people love her and are praying for her. Father, if there's any doubt, take it away. Clear it. Knowing that we serve an almighty God who nothing is impossible. That it's not over until you say it's over. Father, we love you. I pray for this church, Lord, for each and every one in here today, Lord, that you anoint them with your Holy Spirit, that when the Satan fights against them, Lord, that they have the angels there fighting with them that we will put on the full armor of God so that we will not be struck anywhere without protection from you. Watch over us, Lord, guard us, guide us, direct us, use us.